Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak about uh, high-flow nasal cannula and bronchiolitis today. So um, I, I'm uh, giving this talk as both um, a member of the Children's Hospital, uh, but also as uh, a member of the PREDICT network. And at the end, <clears throat> I, um, uh, I will give you a flow chart or flow algorithm uh, about um, uh, how we see um, that high flow uh, could be used uh, or maybe should be used. Okay. Um, <clears throat> briefly, PREDICT is um, the network where this research was conducted. Um, it grew from uh, an initial group of uh, sites uh, to more than 30 active sites now. Um, <clears throat> the uh, classic scenario for a child with bronchiolitis um, is, is shown in this slide. You have a kid with a few days of runny nose, decreased fever in the last 24 hours, and that's the reason why they're presenting to the emergency department. Um, he's developed wheezing and respiratory distress, um, and these are the vital signs. So he has a heart rate of 170, a respiratory of 60, uh, SATs of uh, 87 on room air, uh, he has obvious respiratory distress, is wheezing, and uh, dehydrated, mildly dehydrated. So the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis is bronchiolitis. Uh, management um, is, uh, in our setting, it's nasogastric tube. Uh, for us, that's really the standard rehydration. Um, and what about respiratory support? You have a patient with um, hypoxia on room air. I just want to go back a step. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, I'd really encourage you to look this up. These are the Australasian Bronchiolitis Guidelines. Uh, they've just been published in the Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health. They are based on a couple years of work in the PREDICT group um, to develop a standardized uh, approach and um, uh, advice on what to do and what not to do in bronchiolitis. Uh, there is a 100-page document, and then there is a bedside document, which is one page. So if you focus on that, you'll be fine. Um, this, um, the, the, the right side of the uh, slide shows you the, the, the bottom line findings or recommendations. And essentially, it runs through the medications, such as beta agonists, don't use them. Um, chest x-rays, don't use them. Adrenaline, don't use them. Um, and lots of things no. It's basically all no. Um, and you know, just say no. The, that's the bottom line. Um, so for all interventions, chest physio, suction, etc. And the next step they were doing, because I think one of the problems is with research in general is we do the research and then how does it actually translate on the ground? Um, uh, this is a cluster randomized trial. Um, which we're undertaking within the PREDICT network uh, to try and change practice and reduce these therapies that have, uh, uh, have been proven to not be effective. And we're focusing on the five key ones, and the results of that study should be out soon. A few background issues on bronchiolitis. The number of hospital admissions for bronchiolitis, these are UK data, have clearly increased over time. The cost of bronchiolitis has clearly increased over time. These are Australian data, and if you look on the left side on the x-axis, sorry, y-axis, you have $30 million. That's for intensive care unit care with an increase um, every year um, for the cost of it. Even though the, the length of stay has gone down, the cost has gone up. And then finally, the variation in care. Um, I love this work. This is by uh, Lorraine Schlappach from the um, group in Brisbane. And they looked at risk-adjusted likelihood of a child in the intensive care unit in Australia being intubated. And the risk varies from, you know, if you look at the y-axis, between 5 and 10% up to 35 to 40%. So you ask a parent what they want when they walk through the door you know, the chance of your child getting uh, uh, intubated is, you know, somewhere between 5% and 35%. Which one would you prefer? 
back to the Australasian guidelines. So when you then look at the question of ongoing management and high flow and CPAP, because the studies that I'm going to talk to you about were done bef um, after we developed these Australasian guidelines, um, they, they are quite vague on that issue. High flow and nasal cannula CPAP therapy uh, may be considered in the appropriate uh, board setting. What is high flow? Well, for high flow, you basically, you need water, you need an oxygen source, um, you need a humidifier, and you need a heating circuit. The definition, what you then end up with is, oops, sorry, uh, what you then end up with is heated, humidified, high flow nasal cannula. The definition of what is low flow and high flow is all over the shop. Um, but what a lot of people will use is that they'll say if it's up to two liters per minute, it's low flow. If it's anything more than that, it's, it's high flow. Um, what does high flow do? How is it meant to work? Well, there are a few theories about it. I like them. I like what it says on that slide. It washes out the nasopharyngeal dead space. Uh, it reduces the upper airway resistance, and it, um, uh, it provides a positive distending pressure. That obviously depends on uh, a number of factors. Um, this is a slide that shows you what high flow does and why we pick, in our study, uh, we pick two liters per kilogram per minute. So um, this, these are kids in bronchiolitis, and if you crank up the flow, you ultimately, at about two liters per kilogram per minute, you end up with a positive pharyngeal pressure, which is positive both during expiration and during inspiration. So you have inspiratory support as well as expiratory support of PEEP. Now, in this country, high flow evolved from its use in the pediatric intensive care unit to the retrieval service to the emergency department to the inpatient services. In other countries, that flow sometimes happened in, in, uh, in a different path. Just to show you one slide out of this, um, the, the percentage of retrievals, these are Queensland, mainly Queensland data, um, where they looked at the introduction of high flow and what happened. And as you can see, the number of invasively ventilated, or IV, that's the bottom column, it decreased over time as, as high flow increased. So it changed practice. Now, what's the evidence for high flow in bronchiolitis? Before these studies were done that I'm going to talk to you about, there was a large number, and they're just still coming out, um, about retrospective, prospective studies, pre-post, observational studies in various settings about high flow. But, but they're, they're not randomized trials, controlled trials. There are now three large, high-level randomized trials and there are a couple other trials that I'm not going to talk about, um, usually smaller ones. And um, the, the two trials, the three trials I'm going to talk about is the first one on top um, is the um, uh, study by Elizabeth uh, Kipriotis from Newcastle um, uh, about high flow versus uh, low flow. Um, then the, uh, in the left corner, you have the, um, the Paris study, a randomized trial of high flow in infants with bronchiolitis. And then you have the, the, the Tramontaine study, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, from France, uh, in the intensive care setting on the right lower side. I agree. Um, the, uh, so the, the Tramontaine study was done, uh, it's the first ICU study. Uh, it was done in five French PICUs. Uh, they enrolled 142 children less than six months with severe bronchiolitis, and it compared high flow versus nasal cannula CPAP in PICUs. They compared two liters per kilogram per minute of high flow with nas nasal cannula CPAP um, in this open label randomized trial. Their, their a primary outcome was a uh, composite of uh, clinical factors and an asthma score, uh, which they, um, they uh, used for this study. And they, uh, they defined treatment failure based on this. And there was less treatment failure with nasal cannula CPAP at 31% versus high flow. Having said that, um, the... Um, uh, both arms, if they failed, they could be rescued with the opposite. 
and many of them were. So failures in the high flow group could be rescued with nasal cannula CPAP. Failures in the uh, nasal cannula group could be rescued with high flow. Um, uh, in terms of secondary outcomes, important outcomes were that uh, the intubation rates uh, were not uh, different between the two groups, and there, were, there was no pneumothorax in either group. The second study is the uh, uh, study from Newcastle, published in The Lancet. So this was a single center study. Um, it enrolled 202 children, less than 24 months, admitted with bronchiolitis and an O2 requirement. Um, the uh, comparison was between high flow at one liter per kilogram per minute and low flow at two liters per minute. And as primary outcome, um, the group used the uh, time from randomization to last oxygen use. And as you can see, there was no difference between groups 20 hours versus 24 hours. In terms of secondary outcomes, they also had a composite measure of treatment failure based on a number of clinical factors. Um, and uh, as you can see, high flow had 14% uh, failure and low flow had 33% failure. So that, that was a significant difference. Um, but then the next step is that when you looked at the children with low flow who failed, 61% of them um, could be rescued with high flow. They also found that a high flow was safe and that the, the number of PICU emissions did not differ between the two groups. Um, there has been some discussion about um, the setup of the study. It's an excellent study. Um, but it did exclude the children with a SATs of less than 90% in room air. Uh, they were excluded as severe disease. And some people will argue that's exactly the group that we want to use high flow for. Um, <clears throat> and that then translated into a median, uh, a median SATs of the enrolled patients of 96%. So it's quite a high median SATs um, at the, at the start, start out of the uh, starting point of the study. Um, on to the Paris trial. So the Paris trial uh, was led by Donna Franklin and was published in the New England Journal uh, this year. And the question was, does early use of nasal high flow in infants with bronchiolitis in the emergency department and the pediatric ward setting have a lower failure rate than low flow. So the primary outcome was treatment failure. This was a multi-center, uh, open-label, randomized controlled trial. You cannot blind this. It was similar to the other studies. Couldn't be blinded. Um, and uh, we enrolled 1,400 patients, or the target was 1,400 patients. And it included uh, 17 sites from Australia and New Zealand. And it was a mix of secondary and tertiary sites. And it was very deliberate to uh, use secondary sites as well. Um, so the children had to have, uh, they had to be less than 12 months of age and have clinically diagnosed bronchiolitis and have oxygen saturations of less than 92 or less than 94. And the, the reason why we have two levels of oxygen is that there were some sites where the baseline um, declaration of hypoxia was at 94% and for others it was at 92% or less than 92%. And we just ran with this throughout the trial. The comparison was between high flow two liters per kilogram per minute with an oxygen concentration of 21%, so room air to up to 40%, and low flow at two liters per minute. We excluded uh, children who were, um, you know, uh, obviously uh, a, um, a specific subgroup, such as uh, critically ill patients or kids with congenital heart disease uh, or who had craniofacial abnormalities. There were a few other exclusions. The primary outcome uh, was, again, a, a composite measure. It was failure uh, at two to three hours, uh, which required escalation of treatment or level of care, and three out of four um, uh, parameters, clinical parameters. So it was e either there was no response to the heart rate, um, there was no response to the rest rate, so it didn't drop or was unchanged, the um, oxygen requirements were in excess of the 40% through the high flow system or more than two liters per minute um, in the uh, low flow uh, arm. Uh, 
uh, to keep saturations um, uh, above the threshold that I mentioned before, and that the hospital early warning tool was triggered and escalation uh, of care was, was triggered. And then we had a number of secondary outcomes such as PICU admission, transfer, length of stay, cost, and adverse events. So we screened 20,000 children, um, and then uh, there were about 2,000 that were eligible, um, uh, 1,600 were randomized, and then 1,472 were, were included. Um, there were, as you can see, there were a number that were excluded because they were not eligible or because we, uh, we didn't have the consent of the parents to continue with the study. So in the end, in the two groups, in the standard group, there were 733 patients, uh, so that's the low flow group, and in the high flow group, we had 739 patients. They were, they were very well matched, and I'm just picking out a few of the, uh, the uh, interesting uh, pieces of information. So uh, um, uh, in terms of Maori or Pacific Islanders, about 30%, 27%, premature birth, 17-19%, uh, family history of asthma, um, about half of them, and where respiratory viruses were tested for, um, it was about 55% had RSV. When you then go on to the primary outcome, treatment failure, um, you had 23% treatment failure in the low flow group and 12% failure in the high flow group, um, which had, uh, represents a risk difference of 11%, and that was um, uh, highly significant. Now, when we look at important uh, secondary outcomes, such as days in hospital, transfers to ICU, days in the intensive care unit, days of oxygen, uh, the intubation rate, which overall was very, very low uh, compared to what's been published in the literature, there was no difference. There were no serious adverse events in either group. And um, I think the thing that I personally was most worried about was that uh, these children all going on high flow, you know, would we end up with with Ehrlich syndrome, uh, pneumothorax, and that, that really, really didn't pan out. There was one pneumothorax in each group, in the high flow group and in the low flow group, and they both were treated without um, a chest tube. So there was no difference in length of oxygen treatment, adverse events, length of stay, intubation, ICU admission. I think the other interesting element is that of the children who failed low flow, 61% of them could be rescued with high flow. So high flow was administered on the wards or in the emergency department. So another way of looking at this is, if all children in the study, the 1,472 patients, had received low flow, 77% of them would have been okay with low flow. 23% would have received high flow, and only 133, or less than 10% of the overall number, would have failed that. So when you pull this together, it's the largest study on high flow in bronchiolitis. It showed a very good safety profile for high flow. Um, early high flow uh, showed an initial difference, but it didn't affect uh, key outcomes overall. Now, how do we translate this? Uh, this is too small print for you, but in the predict group, what we've tried to do is pull this together in an algorithm. And uh, Grace Leo has translated this into a, a beautiful um, um, uh, slide that I'm just going to walk you through. If a child is admitted to hospital with bronchiolitis, um, you commence supportive care, such as feeding and fluids. And then the first question is, is the patient hypoxemic? If the patient's hypoxemic, then you commence low flow. Is there a response? If there's yes, then you titrate the, the oxygen. If there's no response, then um, we suggest you start high flow at two liters per kilogram per minute. Is there a response? Then you first titrate the oxygen, or in fact, you start the high flow at, at room air, um, and then you stop the high flow. There's no such thing as weaning the high flow itself. It's either on or off. Remember, the pressure in the or, uh, oropharynx is what you want to create. I'm not going to take you through the rest of this. Uh, but um, uh, Sharon O'Brien has led this, and. Uh, we're hoping for uh, publication soon in, uh, in one of the local journals. Uh, I just want to leave you with this final slide as, um, uh, as just from a practical level. What does two liters per kilo translate into? So for the first 12 kilos, I'm just giving you the, 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 the way we use it at the Children's Hospital here. Two liters per kilogram per minute, greater than 12 kilos, 
Um, uh, we use 2 liters per kilogram per minute for the first 12 kilos, and then an additional 0.5 liters per kilogram per minute for each kilo above that, up to 50. Uh, we feed them with nasogastric tubes during the high flow, and if they're not stabilized, then they get switched to, um, to IV. And um, in closing, I want to thank uh, a huge number of people who have contributed to this research, uh, from Lady Silento, from the PREDICT network, uh, from the regional sites, um, and uh, we really want to thank all the staff uh, at the participating um, sites and the parents who agreed to participate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. All right, so incredibly anticipated study, uh, much dissected already on social media and in real life. Uh, Mel, questions, comments? Yeah, so lots of information sharing on Twitter, and I think the PREDICT website will see a big increase in activity after this session. Um, I do have one question from Casey Parker, who wants to know whether you think high-flow nasal cannula have a bigger role in regional or remote centres where the escalation may require a longer transfer or retrieval. Yeah, um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, we, we are in the process of analysing these data in a bit more detail, um, but... Um, you know, the idea is, I think one of the, the starting points of the study was, uh, can we keep children uh, longer at regional sites without having to transfer them? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I had one other. When we were talking before, you were perhaps lamenting that you felt like this study hadn't moved the dial enough. If you were doing it again, would you do it any differently? I, 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 I don't think so. I think the fundamentals uh, are solid. It, there, there are issues... Um, when you try and create a composite outcome, I mean, we could have just picked an, another a very specific outcome, such as length of stay or length of oxygen. Um, but uh, from a, a, a clinician's perspective, the, the, the idea of having this composite makes sense. Um, you, you know, some of you may know that we're actually conducting another study right now, uh, which is also within the Paris umbrella uh, where we're looking at children outside the bronchiolitis uh, area um, and to see if high flow works for them as well. Yeah. Excellent. Well, would you join me again in thanking Franz Babel? Thank you.